Okay, okay, got a little response from you. That's pretty nice, pretty nice. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, so far, since we started two services, uh, it's been kind of interesting because um, typically the 8.30 service has actually been more full than the 10 o'clock service. So today's the first day I think we'll see that, that balance uh, shift a little bit. So what's that mean for you guys? You know, that means that everyone that leaves here today is getting a 100 Rand gift card for V to E. <laughs> Yeah, and the second service is going to pay for it right now. No, I wish. I wish we could do that for you guys. But, oh, speaking of coffee, I do want to make an announcement. The, the guys up front, I just want you to know about them. That's perfect. Uh, not, not, well, it is perfect coffee, but that's Purpose Coffee, and it's run by Leroy, who's back there, and, and, and Charlie. So the beans are roasted and made by a guy named Charlie, and then Leroy's making the coffee. But they come in here, and they do that for us for free. And... All they take home is they take home the profit that they make. So when you buy a coffee, that money goes directly to them and their business, and they're a strong Christian uh, business. And, um, yeah, so that's the way that we support them, and they support us by giving those services for free. They don't charge us anything. So if you feel moved, if you like their coffee, buy some beans. Uh, grab a cappuccino or a latte or an Americano for them out there because I, I really just want to bless them since they bless us so much. So. All right, let's move into today's message. I'm talking about uh, the divine nature of God. And last week I began to unpack that idea of, of what exactly is the divine nature of God. So I, I believe that the divine nature of God is the essence of God. It's who He is. It, it's what it is that He kind of embodies. It, it's His character. It's His countenance. It's everything about Him. And this is really important to you guys because... The divine nature of God impacts how God views his relationship with you. And then that has an impact on how you enter into and maintain and have a relationship with God. And so the divine nature of God is, it is kind of this big, big concept. But I, I really want to make it, make it super simple for us. And in order for it to be simple, we kind of have to look at, okay, so how is it that we can know the divine nature of God? How, how is it that we can understand it? Uh, what model do we have to look at? Because uh, it, it makes me think of a story. I told this a couple of weeks ago. I was reading a story to my son, Benjamin, and we were reading a Bible story. And then at the end of the Bible story, Benjamin's takeaway was, well, God's not real because I can't see him. And I thought, that's a problem. The pastor's kid is saying that God's not real. And Benjamin's this old, if you don't know me. And so I had to explain to him, yes, you, can, you, know, you can't see God, but yes, God is real. And then he said, okay, no, I understand that. But as far as we experience God, it's easy for us to not experience God because, yes, we can't see him. And so how is it that we discover the divine nature of God? How, how can we discover something that I feel like can have such a huge impact on you and on your life that it can actually change your life? Well, we have somebody that we can look at when we think about that. And we can understand and know the divine nature of God by looking at this guy in the Bible named Jesus. Now, Jesus was an exact imprint of the nature of God. He was an exact replica of God. So when Jesus came to earth, he came as a representation of God. And many times in the New Testament, Jesus says, he actually says, if you know me, then you know God. And if you know God, then you know me. If you know my Father, then you know me. If you know me, you know my Father. So Jesus is telling us that he's God and God is him. So what we can do today in this today and age, if it's important for us to understand the divine nature of God, then we can look at Jesus and we can pick up on what the divine nature is of God is. Now, something we're going to talk about with Jesus today. Jesus, uh, when he would enter into a town, so he, he was in his ministry, during his ministry, uh, those three years that he was operating, Jesus would come into a town, and when he would come into a town, because of his reputation, people would actually bring out. Now, has anyone seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Okay, a couple of you. Bring out your dead, bring out your dead. You remember that? He's just, when the guy's going through town, and he's saying, bring out your dead. Well, that's what I thought about when I thought about Jesus going into town. But it wasn't bring out your dead. Jesus would roll through town, and people would bring the sick and the blind to him. And Jesus would heal them. And in fact, the New Testament tells us over and over again that, that just exactly that. Jesus would bring the sick and the blind, and Jesus would heal them all. There was actually only one place where this did not happen. We'll, we'll talk about that at the end. So I believe that Jesus had 
a lot of encounters with blind people. He had a lot of encounters with sick people, but we're talking about blind people today. Today's message is knowing his divine nature, the blind man. And of all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blind people that we can assume that Jesus healed, there were five that Jesus had a really personal encounter with. Five situations where Jesus had this this personal kind of relationship with, and it's recorded for us in in the Gospels. And and the first one is that Jesus healed a, a blind man just by simply touching him. And then Jesus healed a blind man just by simply speaking to him. And then there was another one where Jesus healed a blind man because he cast a demon out of him. And then there is one, and this is where it gets a little bit gross here, is that Jesus heals a blind man by walking up and he spits on the ground. And he, he mixes it up with his fingers into the, the, the dust and dirt. And he makes mud. And then he just smears that on the guy's eyes. I just think that's like the grossest thing in the world. I can almost relate because... Uh, our son Benjamin, he's 18 months old. He's this old. And uh, he, or Wyatt, thank you. That's why I do this. So you guys know, whatever I say, you know which child it is. Wyatt, he gets his little grubby hands and face dirty with stuff. And, and then he wants to touch my face and touch me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, Casey gives him things like peanut butter and oatmeal and things like that. And he just, he experiences food. So I can't imagine what it would have been like. Well, I guess the blind man didn't know because he couldn't see. So he didn't know it was spit and mud. But it was. It was spit and mud. And then there was another one where Jesus actually, and this is where it gets even worse than that, where Jesus actually spits directly onto the blind man's face. And when he does, that, that, that heals the blind man. Did you guys know that the, the Greek word for spit is patchouli? It is. That's not even a joke. It is. And, and, and that means, well, it literally means just to spit. And so, now, one of these five is not like the other. They, they all have to do with Jesus doing something to heal the blind man. But one of them is not like the other. And the one that is not like the other has something very unique that happens that we don't see happen anywhere else in the Bible. It especially doesn't happen with any other sick people. It doesn't happen with, with any other blind people. It's something extremely unique that happens here. And oftentimes this gets extremely misunderstood. But it does such a beautiful job of displaying the divine nature of God. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you now where I want to end up in this message is I want to end up at the end with you sitting there in your chairs and you being able to say, Wow, the divine nature of God is for me because He loves me, He wants to save me, He wants to heal me, and I want that in my life. That's where I want to end on with you guys. But let's, let's read the story here. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 8 and look at that here. And I, I've, it's, it's quite a bit of scripture, so I've got it here for us. Uh, you guys can follow along the screen, and I'm going to read. So this is Mark 8, verses 22 through 26. And it says this. Then they came to Bethsaida, and, and they as the disciples and, and Jesus. So they come into Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. So far, normal. Same as usual. Jesus comes into town. They bring a blind person to come to Jesus. And so taking the blind man by the hand, Jesus led him out of the village. Now that's going to be significant later. And after spitting on his eyes and laying hands on him, so there's the gross part. But again, I guess he's blind, so he doesn't know. He may think it's water, holy water, or something like that. I, I like to imagine all of his buddies, you know, the, the blind man guys, what just happened? And his buddies are like, oh, it's water. It's definitely water. It wasn't spit at all. So, so he laid his hands on him, and he asked him, after he spit on his eyes, puts his hands on him, asked him, this is key here, do you see anything? And he looked up, and he said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Okay, that maybe poses a problem. Then again, again, this is the important thing here, again, this is where we don't see this anywhere else in the the Bible with any other miracle, again, Jesus laid his hands on his eyes, and the man stared intently, and his sight was completely restored, and he began to see everything clearly. So now it's not men like trees, it's everything he sees clearly. And then Jesus sent him to his home saying, Do not even enter this village. 
And that's also going to be significant there at the end. Now, why on earth did Jesus have to heal this guy twice? That this is going to tell us something very, very important about the divine nature of God. And it's going to especially highlight something that's really important about us. And this is the thing that gets very misconstrued by people. Was Jesus not powerful enough to heal the man in the first go? Or was the sin so powerful that it took Jesus two efforts in order to heal him? Or maybe this is an example where, where Jesus wants you to understand that he's so persistent in his pursuit of you that even if it doesn't work the first time, he's going to continue and continue until it finally does work in your life. So those are all points that we can take. We could argue for all of them, but none of those are what it is. Because Jesus, the creator of the universe, in the beginning when God made the world, when God made the universe, it said God was, was there and the word was with God. And that, that's Jesus. Jesus and God were there at the beginning of creation, at the beginning of time. And Jesus, in Isaiah, it says that, that, that Christ holds the universe in the palm of his hand. I just can't imagine that the guy that holds the universe in the palm of his hand, the guy that helped create the universe and this world that we walk in today, the guy that resurrected himself and rose from the dead three days later, that he would have to heal a regular guy twice. In fact, later we can look in the New Testament, we see stories and stories and stories, but there's one really specific where the disciples go out and they're practicing what Jesus has taught them. And they come back to Jesus and they say, oh, well, th th there's a, a, a God that's possessed that we can't heal. And Jesus goes up and Jesus heals him and they say, well, what, what, how did you do that? And he said, well, all you have to do is speak my name. So what that tells us is just the whisper of the name of Jesus is enough to heal. So why did it take twice? Because this reveals something about us. See, every single one of us we actually have two sets of eyes. We've got in us, we've got our natural set, and they're going to put this on the screen for you, our natural set and our spiritual set. All of us have these, these, these things, and we, we live in this tension between the natural and the spiritual. We live kind of, we often see things in the natural, but then God often sees things, you know, in the spiritual and what this is saying is in that we have a natural set of eyes and then we have a spiritual set of eyes is that we are a complex representation of God. We were made in the image of God. And what this means for you is that even if you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe in church, that's okay. Welcome. So glad that you're here today. Hopefully you can learn something that interests you and piques your interest. Maybe I could uh, help you understand how much Jesus loves you. But he made you with more than just the natural eyes, the natural ears, because there's things in your heart that well up, that you want, that you desire. You have good vibes about things. You have bad vibes about things. There is more than just what happens with, with our eyes and our ears. Life is more than what we see and what we hear. Now, Jesus wants our heart. He wants our spirit. He wants us to give our life to him. So there is a spiritual uh, essence to who we are. We all have Natural, and then we all have spiritual. So when Jesus heals the guy the first time, the first touch was the healing of his spiritual eyes. L let me prove this to you, okay? I can prove it. I can prove it by reading. Uh, there's a, a, I have a ton of verses here. They're not going to be on the screen because uh, it was too many, so I've got them right here. But I can prove to you this fact. So we hear the, the phrase, I see people like trees. That, that, that's the one that we're looking at here. Remember, he touches him, spits, touches. The guy says, I see people like trees. Okay, well, let me show you what trees represent in the Bible. Trees in the Bible represent mankind. And so, here it is. In Psalm 1, uh, chapter 1, 1 through 3. And he will be like a tree firmly planted and fed by the streams of the water. Psalm 52, 8. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Psalm 92, 12. It says, they grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The righteous will flourish like a date palm. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. For he will be nourished like a tree planted by the waters. Isaiah 55, 12. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Guess what doesn't clap? Trees don't clap. People clap. See, Jesus is talking here. This, the Bible is talking about mankind. Trees represent mankind. 
kind. And then just a couple more. Matthew 7, 17. Even so, every healthy tree bears good fruit. Zechariah 4, 11 says, What are these two olive trees on the right side of the lampstand and on its left? Even in Revelation, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands hanging before God and the earth. Trees represent mankind, but trees in the Bible is a spiritual reference to mankind. So when Jesus heals him on the first touch and he says... I see men like trees. He has opened his spiritual eyes. Isn't that amazing? It's 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 unbelievable. I mean, that's something I would have never known that on my own, but to to study this and to uncover that is to me it's just an unbelievable thing. Jesus healed his spiritual eyes first. So this is a question that I ask. We've now got to ask ourselves this question is is what does this tell us about the divine nature of God? Well, it, it tells us that God cares about more than just your natural life, more than just your bills. He cares about your bills, your house. He cares about all of that stuff. He cares about your health. But God also, more importantly, cares about your soul. He cares about the spiritual side of you. And so our, our takeaway from just this point right here is, is this, is that what Jesus did for the blind man, God wants to do for us. So Jesus prioritizing This man's heart, his salvation, his forgiveness of sins, the spiritual side of him. God is also prioritizing that in you. That means that you are valuable. That means that you walk around with a heartbeat that's extremely, extremely valuable to God. And just like this blind man was blind, not only naturally blind, but spiritually blind, we are all born spiritually blind, all of us. And what this means for us is that when you come into the world, you come into the world separate from God. You come in as a sinner. Everyone's born with a sinful nature. That's why we don't have to teach our kids how to lie. We don't have to teach our, our, our kids how to, how to steal. We, we don't have to teach our kids how to manipulate. Benjamin is starting to manipulate Casey and I. I will hear him ask Casey for something, and she will say no. He will come into me, and he will say, Mom said that I could have... Will you get that for me? And I'll say, you are crazy. Absolutely not. And we didn't teach him how to do that. He, he just learns that on his, on his own. We're, we're born with a sinful nature. It doesn't mean that we're born bad people. It just means that we're all born kind of spiritually blind. And God wants us to have this encounter with Jesus so that our eyes are open, our spiritual eyes are open. And when our spiritual eyes are open, something really special happens. There's actually like a a progression that I want to show you guys that that comes out of this. And this highlights why it's so important that Jesus did what he did. So if we read Matthew 13, verse 3, we go here and it says, This is the reason that I speak to crowds in parables. So Jesus is talking here. And he said, here's why I talk in parables. And and if you've never read the Bible or the New Testament, parables were these these sort of metaphors and stories that Jesus told. It put things into context for people so that they could understand the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach. So he says, here's why I do that. Because while having the power of seeing, they do not see. Their spiritual eyes are closed. And while having the power of hearing, they do not hear because their spiritual ears are clogged. Nor do they understand and grasp The spiritual things. See, this is where I feel like that God really, his heart breaks for us. If you don't understand or grasp what's happening in the spiritual, then you're not understanding and grasping what Jesus did when he hung on the cross for you. When he died and he gave his life for you. So he he wants us to grasp those things. And then it goes on here in, in Matthew 13, 14 and 15. This is where Jesus quotes Isaiah and Jesus is, you know, uh, so amazing that he pulls this verse in from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is very relevant to the New Testament. When Jesus came, he broke a lot of the Old Testament laws, meaning you didn't have to go to the temple for sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrifice. But it doesn't discredit the wonderful teachings and the prophecy that's in the Old Testament. And so he goes on to say this, in them, so in the people that can't hear and the people that can't see, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. So now he's going to read this prophecy to, uh, to people here. And it, it, he says, You will hear and keep on hearing, but never understand. You will look and keep on looking, but never comprehend. 
for the nation's heart has grown hard. See, there's a heart issue. When you can't see and you can't hear, turns out it's connected to your heart. For the nation's heart has grown hard, and with their ears they hardly hear, and they have tightly closed their eyes. Otherwise, so if it wasn't that they couldn't hear, if it wasn't that their hearts were hard, if it wasn't that they had tightly closed their eyes. See, a hard heart indicates intentionality. Tightly closing your eyes indicates that you are intentionally not wanting to see. And because of that, it will otherwise, if they were not doing that, They would see with their eyes, they would hear with their ears, and they would understand with their heart. Now here comes this really amazing part here. And they would turn to me, and I would heal them spiritually. Now this is where this really important progression kind of comes in here. Let me take that verse here. If you don't quite understand what I just read, that's okay. I didn't understand it the first time I read it either. But here's essentially what it means here. It says this, if you don't see in the Spirit... You can't hear spiritually. That makes sense. If you don't see in the Spirit, you can't hear spiritually. Let let me give a little context to that. If you don't see in the Spirit, then you maybe can't hear the voice of God. If you don't see in the Spirit, then maybe you don't feel the conviction of, okay, I'm about to do something wrong. I shouldn't do that wrong thing. So if you don't see in the Spirit, you can't hear spiritually. You know what else you can't hear spiritually? God and Jesus whispering down to you in your dark time saying, hey, I love you. Hey, you mattered to me. Hey, I died on the cross for you. Hey, you're important to me. That also is part of not being able to hear spiritually. And it goes on. So if you don't see in the spirit, you can't hear spiritually. If you don't hear spiritually, you can't understand with your heart. Seeing linked to hearing. Hearing linked to understanding. If you don't understand with your heart, then you cannot turn and be healed. See, Jesus wants our hearts to be healed. He he, he wants us to have our our pains, our struggles. He wants our our physical problems and world, even that, to be healed. But he also really wants this spiritual healing for us. Now, why does this matter to me? And why do I think this matters to you? I only say things up here that I think matter to you. Because at at the kind of the... The, the summation of this is this, that Jesus died on the cross for you. Which means that whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you come with, whatever you believe, whatever you did in your life, whatever sin is currently still in your life, whatever addictions that you have, whatever kind of shortfalls that you have, no matter how much pride or anger or temper or whatever it is that you have and who you are, Jesus Christ loved you so much that he died for you. He gave himself for you so that you could be eternally healed. It says, heal them spiritually. In fact, let's go back to this verse here. And it says, look at what's in between understanding and healing. It's, it's this word turn. So he says, and understand with their heart. That means that something's happening in here for you. It means that that you're starting to feel something in here. God is speaking to your heart. And every morning when I get up to read my Bible, I ask God, speak to my heart. Change my heart. Awaken my heart. I want my heart to have an understanding of you. And turn to me and I would heal them spiritually. Between understanding in my heart and being healed spiritually... Meaning that Jesus takes away my burdens. He takes away some of my stress and my anxiety. He lightens my load for me. But also, July 21st, 1996, when I got down on one knee, or two knees actually, and I gave my life to Jesus. I invited him into my heart. I I made him my Lord and Savior. I was once and forever, all and eternally healed spiritually. But what's in between those is the word turn. And what he means by the word turn is it's, it's confession. It, it, it's repentance. It means I'm going to turn away from my sin. It means that I understand now that the healing that I look for, that you offer me, all I have to do is choose you, God. And when I choose you, I can turn away from my sin. And when I turn away from my sin, I get this healing spiritually. And so what I've done, and again, I don't want to take any liberties here, is I've just explained a, a lot of things to you guys and, and kind of maybe even declared a few things. 
And maybe they're true, maybe they're not true. Maybe you believe them, maybe you don't believe them. Maybe you're a bit of a skeptic and you say, okay, that's great and all, but how, how can we prove this? And we prove this the same way that we can prove anything in the Bible. Wouldn't it be great if we knew exactly when we heard from God and what it was that he was saying and whether or not it was true? Well, wouldn't it be great if we opened the Bible and we could read a verse and we could say, okay, I'm hearing this from God and I know that this is true in my life. I, I, I know it above and beyond anything else. Well, we can do that. Sometimes maybe it takes a little bit of effort and it takes a little bit of prayer. But here's two ways that you can test the scripture. And there's two ways that you can test what's being said, especially here on this stage. Now, I encourage you, test my words. Test what I say. Let it inspire you to dig into the Bible. And then if you have a problem with it, call Pastor Linton. <laughs> Don't call me, call him. No, he'll walk you through it. See, here's how we know that we hear from God. And we know that what we hear is accurate. Number one, it agrees with the whole Bible. So what you read on one part of the Bible, it, it agrees with the rest of the Bible. And, and, and number two, it agrees with context. And by context, it means when you read a verse, you should probably read a little bit before and you should read a little bit after. When I prepare and I study for these things, I, I actually you know, will, will read chapters before and chapters after because I want to know the whole context about what it is that we're saying here. And if you take a verse out of context, then you can actually use it to prove anything. I've got an example for you. And this isn't my example. I stole this from a, another sermon that I was listening to. Did you know that uh, Moses played tennis? I can prove to you in the Bible that Moses played tennis. Yeah. So there's a, a verse in the Old Testament where it says that, that Moses refused to serve in the courts of Pharaoh. <laughs> right? See, Moses played tennis. I, I can also, we can prove that David rode a motorcycle. Because David rode into battle in triumph. The <laughs> triumph motorcycles. Now, the, the point to that is that you can prove anything you want by just picking a verse out of there. It's, it's all about context. So let me give you the context to Jesus healing the blind man. So Jesus has just come from, from feeding 4,000 people. A lot of us know the story of when Jesus fed the 5,000, but there's also one where Jesus feeds the 4,000. And so he feeds 4,000 people. It's a miracle. They did it with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And Jesus broke it up and he handed it out. And, and they fed everybody. Everybody was full. And they even had some left over. And right after Jesus does this, right after he does this miracle and he feeds all these 4,000 people, look at, look at what happens here in, in verse 11. So we're backing up in the chapter. This is part of the read before. See, the Pharisees, this is right after the miracle, the Pharisees came out and they began to argue contentiously and they began to debate. And they're debating with Jesus and they demand from him a sign from heaven to test him because of their unbelief. You just watched a man feed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and you walk up and you see and you, you say, hey, show me a sign from heaven. If that's not spiritual blindness, then I don't know what is. See, everybody's born spiritually blind until... We give our lives to Jesus. And we have that, that spiritual side of us you know, awaken. And the Pharisees had not done that. And the Pharisees were spiritually blind. A miracle happens right in front of them. And they say, hey, show me a sign. Jesus is like, guys, everybody's full. What to, what, I don't understand what to show you here. And, and it doesn't end with the Pharisees here. We go on to verse 12. Jesus, he groaned. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation demand a sign? He's talking about the generation of the Pharisees there. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. So Jesus is like, I've had it and I'm over it. I can't believe that you're this blind that you missed it. Now, this isn't just limited to the Pharisees. The disciples also get in hot water over this as well. So let's look at that. It just continues on. Leaving them, he again boarded the boat. So Jesus left the Pharisees, gets on the boat. And now the disciples had forgotten to bring the bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. Twelve disciples and one loaf. So they, they get on the boat and they're hungry. 
and say, okay, P hey, Peter, did you bring the bread? And Peter says, you know, no, I don't have the bread. You just, you have the bread. And Jesus is like, I'm not spending money on bread. You know, I'm holding the money here. We don't have enough. We can't afford it. But the disciples are like, oh, wow, we've made a mistake. We've only got one loaf of bread. We left like 12 baskets full of broken pieces of bread and fish on shore over there, you know, and we've only got one loaf here. And so they said, they've only got one loaf. And while they're standing there with one loaf of bread, Jesus begins to teach them. He's, he's helping the disciples to learn something here. Jesus repeatedly ordered them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven, leaven used in bread, of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So what Jesus is saying there is beware of the teaching of the Pharisees. Beware of the sustenance of Pharaoh. See, bread is more than just what feeds your, your natural self. Bread is also compared to, or it's also a metaphor for what Jesus uses to feed our soul. When Jesus says that I am the bread from above and I will give you eternal life, I will feed your soul eternally. Jesus is talking about himself as the bread. So when Jesus, this, there's a whole theme of bread here. Jesus is such a smart teacher. He just fed a bunch of people with bread. And he says, I'm going to continue on that theme. And I'm going to teach the disciples about this. So beware of the leaven. Now the disciples, they begin discussing this with one another, saying this is because we don't have any bread that he said this to us. So the disciples think, oh, th this must be because we don't have any bread. And this is spiritual blindness. The disciples don't see it. They've watched Jesus feed 5,000 people, and then they watch Jesus feed 4,000 people, and now they think there's a problem because one loaf won't be able to feed 12. I think Jesus can handle 12 people with one loaf. And I think that they should have known that, but they, they don't. They don't understand. They're spiritually Blind. So Jesus wants to awaken them. And he says in verse 17, he says, Jesus, aware of this discussion, he says to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you still not see? And do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened? And so Jesus is checking their heart. Guys, is your heart soft to my spirit? Are you wanting to listen? Are you wanting to learn? What's happening in your heart? That's why I warned them against the Pharisees and Herod. Because he's saying, hey, check your heart. Make sure your heart's okay. And so then he goes on in verse 18 and he says, Though you have eyes, do you not see? And though you have ears, do you not hear and listen to what I have said? And do you not remember when I broke five loaves for the 5,000? Jesus is teaching us. To, he's awakening their spiritual eyes. He's reminding them that something amazing has happened before them. And don't forget. And then it goes on and Jesus goes on and says, How many baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they answered, Twelve. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many large baskets full of broken pieces did you pick up? And they answered, Seven. Twelve and seven. There is Plenty. When Jesus works in your life and he works the miracles, there's never a shortage. There's always leftovers. And then Jesus finishes out this teaching and he says, and he was saying to them, do you still not understand? See, the Pharisees were spiritually blind. The disciples were spiritually blind. Now, what, what is it that causes spiritual blindness in us? What is it that can cause? Because the Pharisees had, given their, had not given their hearts to Jesus. They were not worshiping him. They were actively against him. It makes sense that they were spiritually blind. But the disciples, they were, they were following Jesus. They were part of his miracles. And they, they loved Jesus. They really did. So how is it that they were also spiritually blind? Well, our spiritual blindness, so, so that means that that every single one of us in this room, me included, can be spiritually blind to things. And oftentimes that spiritual blindness comes from unconfessed spiritual sin. Unconfessed sin causes spiritual blindness. Now, what this can mean for us, again, like the Pharisees, or, or let's take me, July 20th, 1996, I had not asked Jesus into my life and not asked for forgiveness of my sins. I was spiritually blind because I had unconfessed sin in my life. I confessed that sin. I gave my life to Jesus. I no longer was spiritually blind.
But even now, sometimes, I can open my Bible, I can read my Bible, I can pray, and I can feel like it's just words on a, on a book, and it's just you know my words that are hitting the ceiling and coming straight back down again. And usually what that means in my life is there's some sin that I need to confess to God. And when we think about sin, we, all, you know, we always think like, I broke something, I'm addicted to something, I've done something. But a lot of times it's just the sin of, of, of not spending time telling Jesus how much you love Him. Or it's a, a sin of, of pride that you're carrying around in your heart. Or it's a, a sin of, um, a, a, of, you know, oftentimes really what it comes down to, especially for me, i give you a personal example with me here is a lot of times I try and take my life in my own hands, try and work out my own problems, try and deal with my own stress, when God's over here next to me saying, you're not going to be able to do this, Chris, just give, it, just give it to me. And I say, yeah, but I don't trust you with it. It's a sign. Yeah, I also need new underwear. Okay. That, that, that got me there. Yeah. I won't turn around. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. See? Uh, yeah, it's unconfessed sin causes spiritual blindness. And for those of you that have given your life to Jesus, like the disciples, I don't want you to walk out of here thinking there's something crazy, inherently wrong, or questioning your salvation. Don't do that at all. Your salvation is set in stone. You can't get rid of that. Jesus forgave you once and for all of your sins. Nothing can take that away from you. But maybe it just means there's something in your life that you're trying to hold on to that you need to give to God. Because when we try to hold on to something that we should give to God, that it's, that's just a form of pride. When I walk out of here and I think to myself, did I do good enough for them, for you guys? That's a, that's a form of pride. That's me saying, I, I'm taking it. And God reminds me, hey, this isn't about you. And so... The way that we deal with this right here, it's just very simple. We confess that you need the light of the world to see, and he will take away all your sins. It's just confession. You have unconfessed sin, you confess that sin, and you're no longer spiritually blind. Now, there's one more thing that happens in this story. And I kind of alluded to it at at, at the beginning and then at the end. But before I, I tell you that, let me just go back to context, okay? So Jesus feeds 4,000 people. Then they come off the boat. And then on the boat, before they come off the boat, they're having this discussion about bread and spiritual blindness and their eyes not being open and their ears not being open. They come off the boat and a blind man comes up to Jesus. That's why Jesus takes the opportunity to heal him first spiritually. Because he just spent time teaching his disciples about those who have eyes but can't see and ears that can't hear. See, when we look at it that way, this spiritual healing of the blind man is not just an isolated event because it is. Instead, it's exactly what Jesus wanted it to be because Jesus had been teaching them about this. He teaches them and then he shows them. So he takes that opportunity to show, hey guys, look at what this looks like in real life. Let me show you what this looks like when I put this into practice. And now, something that I think is really important here, and this is our our last takeaway here. At the beginning of this uh, encounter that Jesus has, Jesus, uh, in 23, it says, He takes the blind man by the hand. He leads him out of the village. So, okay, why why would he do that? You know, that when you read the Bible, ask the question, why? Okay, why would he lead him out of the village? And then after he heals him, in verse 26, it says that he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. See, the village that they were in was a village called Bethsaida. And guess what happened previously in Bethsaida? Bethsaida was one of those villages and towns that Jesus went to, and the blind and the sick were not brought to him. It's the only place where Jesus left And was disappointed because no one came to be healed. No one came to have an encounter with him. In fact, he was almost kind of run out of town. And the Bible goes on to say that that if if even Sodom and Gomorrah had had the experiences that Bethsaida had with Jesus, then they would have not been destroyed. And yet Bethsaida boots Jesus out of town. 
And so Jesus is telling him, that's why he takes him out of the village of Bethsaida. That's why he tells him, don't go back into the village of Bethsaida because the blind man's not from there. Jesus landed and he was traveling through there. The blind man was brought through to him. So when Jesus left that village uh, the first time, he said, okay, nothing is ever going to happen here. And see, what this shows us is that it was, it was too late for them. That even after healing the blind man, he said, don't go there. Don't tell them this story. It's too late. But guess what? For us, it's not too late. And it never is too late. And so what, what I have for us this morning is the opportunity. If you are spiritually blind, whether you are a, a non-Christ follower, you don't know Jesus, or it's been kind of on your heart, you've been thinking about it, but you just you know, haven't taken that step, or whether you are, like me, a follower of Christ, you read your Bible, you're a good person, you go to church, you're in a small group, you know, all of those things, and you're feeling like, you know, a little bit spiritually blind. I haven't heard from God in how long? I haven't gotten something out of my Bible in how long? I haven't been able to encourage a fellow brother or sister in how long? If you find yourself spiritually blind, then we get an opportunity to wake up this morning. You get an opportunity to open your eyes. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And as I do that, the band will come out and then we'll have a response time. We're in that time. You can go to the back and you can take communion. And there'll be somebody there to help you with that. And you can go into the other corner back here. You can light a candle in, in representation of, of a prayer. Sometimes it's nice to physically do something to tie towards a prayer. Or if you need prayer for anything, then you can come over here on this side and meet on the carpet. And you can get prayer from our great prayer team. But I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and if you are spiritually blind, then I want you to take this opportunity to open your eyes. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for how good you are, how great and amazing you are, and how much you love us. And so I just want to say this to those that are listening right now. If you find that you're somebody who has never given your life to Jesus. You don't know that if you died today, you don't know where you would go. Or if you died today, you know that you would not go to heaven, you, you would go to hell. If that's you, if there's an unknown in you on what happens after this world, then today's the day to open your eyes to the blessings and the love that is Jesus Christ. And so if that's you, then you can just pray this kind of in your spirit and you can pray it after me. Heavenly Father, I no longer want to be blind. I confess to you my sin. Forgive me of that sin. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Become my Lord and my Savior. Father, come into my heart and save me. And if that's the first time that you've prayed that prayer, then praise God, amen, hallelujah. Heaven is throwing a party for you. And I want you to come and tell somebody after the service. Tell me or our prayer volunteers. But tell somebody, Jesus says, to confess it with our lips. And now for those of you that have, have known God and, and you're just feeling a little spiritually blind, you know, the, the word's not popping off the Bible, you're not able to encourage your friends, your family, but you're just feeling far from God, then we pray a prayer of something as simple as this, Heavenly Father, I haven't seen you in a while. I haven't seen the fruits of your love in my life for a while. Maybe my eyes are closed. Father, reveal in my heart what I need to confess to you. And Father, I confess to you what you reveal. Thank you, Jesus, for opening my eyes. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.